afternoon. How is everybody today? Good. Supposed to be almost 60 tomorrow, I guess? Yes. That's why you've got a short sleeve shirt on. Right? Hey, you know. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. Uh, this is a, uh, today is a biography, I guess you want to call it that. Uh, I'm probably one of the most popular Americans come out of the 20th century. Eleanor Roosevelt. Now it's interesting, uh, Gallup took a poll in 1999, 37 years after her death, and it was, you know, a poll who was, who was the most popular, most notable American, that kind of thing. And after 39 years after her death, she still finished ninth. Boy, that's staying power. You know, it's interesting, I, I, I've been doing some biographies on, on women as of late because it's uh, Women's History Month. I've done Eleanor, I've done El Helen Keller, uh, Amelia Earhart, and it's interesting what you see coming out of the 19th into the 20th centuries here with some of these women. Uh, they're, you know, they're, they're really taking their place on the world stage here with Eleanor, again, Helen Keller. Helen Keller is interesting. Of course, you know, what's interesting about Helen Keller is uh, she's popular, but, you know, depending on who and what you read, boy, as soon as they find out she was a socialist. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, interesting. And the fascinating thing about uh, Amelia Earhart is there's no closure here. <laughs> They still don't know. And we'll get into a little bit of, of, of Amelia Earhart because she became pretty good friends with Eleanor Roosevelt. And so, uh, yeah, the, the, the interesting people she meets and commiserates with along the way. But anyway, uh, Eleanor, you know, the, the, the start off here with Eleanor Roosevelt, the era of American history she's born in. She's born in 1884, but she's born into a time when the country's changing. I mean, look, look, look at how this, look at this light lady's lifestyle. Uh, this lifespan. She's born into a world where they're still using the horse and buggy, and yet she'll see the Cuban Missile Crisis. Yeah, boy, the changes that went along here, huh? Yeah. And so the, the, the country is changing. It's moving away from its agrarian roots and becoming an industrial power. America's taking its place on the world stage here. It's corporatizing is basically what it's doing here. And this is the world this lady will be born into. You know, she's born in 1884 to, a, to an Elliot Bellick Roosevelt and an Anna Rebecca Hall Roosevelt. And her, her father is related to Theodore Roosevelt. So Eleanor will be the niece of Theodore Roosevelt. She will have a brother, Elliot. She will also have another brother, Hall. And she will have another brother, Elliot Roosevelt Mann. Now, the third one is, a, is a, a product of a tryst that her father had with one of the domestics. Um, her, mother, her mother, though, her mother, though, will die when she's eight years old of diphtheria. Her brother, Elliot, who's four years old, will die when, she, when Eleanor is nine from diphtheria. Her father will die when she's 10. He was an alcoholic. He threw himself out of a window at a sanitarium, but that won't kill him. He will die later of a seizure. So, you know, I mean, it's nice to say that this lady was born perhaps with a silver spoon in her mouth, but it's still a rough start here. And she also knows, you know, she's not stupid. She also knows, you know, when she's like 12, 13, 14, this lady is not the prettiest lady to come down the pike. <laughs> she's just not. However, she also will write that if you have honor and loyalty stamped on your face, that people will gravitate towards you. Mm -hmm. Boy, mm -hmm. prophetic words, they were. She will eventually live with her grandmother, uh, Mary Livingston Ludlow. That was her, uh, mother's, her mother's mother. And by the time she's 13, 14, she is sleeping with her bedroom door locked because she can't trust her grandmother's sons. Now, altogether, not a, not a terrific start here. Not a terrific start here. However, there's, a sal there's salvation coming here. 
You know, you know, back in the day when they used to send young ladies to finishing schools, well, Eleanor's not going to be any different. She's going to go to Allenswood in England, Wimbledon, not far from, uh, not far from London. And the, the lady who's the mistress of the school is named Marie Sylvester. Now, Marie Sylvester is a, is a turning point in Eleanor's life. Marie Sylvester is, a, is the type that, you know, these young ladies that go to this school, they're going to be taught not only to be critical thinkers, but free thinkers. And it's here, Ellen, and, El, and Marie Sylvester likes Eleanor. She really does. And Eleanor will learn history, learn how to speak French, you know, uh, she'll, be a, she'll be taught a wide range of subjects here opens up the mind. It really does. It really does. However, she'll be there three years. She will be called home. Well, you know how they used to have these coming out parties, these debutante parties for young ladies and so on and so forth, right? Well, Eleanor is no different. She can't stand this party because half the people there she doesn't even know. She probably wishes she was back in Allenswood. She really, really liked Allenswood. However, when she's you know, 18, she's going, to meet, she's going to meet her future husband, Franklin D. Roosevelt. And the two really hit it off. And uh, he really becomes enamored with, with this young lady. Uh, but of course, his mother has different ideas. Sarah Delano Roosevelt, very domineering person. You know, and the and the two are engaged at this point, and Sarah says, "No, she doesn't want her son marrying Eleanor. Eleanor, to the point where she's going to take her son on a three-month vacation in the Caribbean, so they break it off. It doesn't work. You know, here Franklin stands up to his mother and says, "I know I'm disappointing you, but he says I've made up my mind." And the two will plan to get married. Yeah, but there's a problem here. Her father's gone, so who's going to give the bride away? Theodore Roosevelt. He's currently the president. Now, we're talking 1904, 1905 here. He's still president of the United States. So I don't have to tell you women how it is planning a marriage, planning to get married. Try planning it around the president's schedule. Why did the mother not like Eleanor? She didn't think she was right for Franklin. Number one, she wasn't the prettiest lady to come down the pike, again, as I mentioned earlier. And he th she thought she should be, she, he should be marrying somebody more on a, at least had the looks of a higher societal level. I mean, keep in mind, these are very class-conscious co class people. And she didn't think Eleanor fit the bill. But Eleanor was the same family. How could she not Correct. be the same Correct. Well, class? keep in mind, too, there is that difference in this family between Democrats and Republicans. And she was very much conservative, this lady. And so what you're going to see here is, yes, they are eventually going to get married, but it's going to be St. Patrick's Day, 1905. And the reason for that is because Theodore Roosevelt will be in New York that day. <laughs> Now, if you are getting married and, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the person that, and the man that gives the bride away is the president, who do you think the, report, the reporters are going to flock to? <laughs> and he's asked many questions here at, at this wedding. In fact, one journalist asked him, well, what do, you th what's the, what do you think about the idea of the bride and groom having the same name? And, he, and, Frank, and uh, Theodore Roosevelt's reply is, well, it's nice to keep the name in the family. <laughs> So the two will set up shop, Eleanor, Franklin and Eleanor, and they, and they will live at Hyde Park, but they're also going to have an apartment down in New York City. And they're going to escape up to Hyde Park for a short honeymoon and then set up shop in, in, in New York City before going on a three-month honeymoon into Europe. However, uh, <laughs> with the apartment in New York City, uh, guess who has the adjoining apartment? <laughs> With sliding doors yet. <laughs> yeah, Sarah Delano Roosevelt. And as the children come along, there'll be six. Anna and five brothers, right? As the children come along, it was James Roosevelt said that their grandmother told them, told each of them, your mother might have bore you, but I'm your mother. 
How would you like to live that way? You know, they're 10 years into this marriage, and, and Eleanor tells her husband, I can't take this anymore. Gee, I wonder why. <laughs> Keep in mind, though, we're now by 1915, 1916. And Franklin is becoming more and more popular in the Democratic Party, to the point we're going to get into the First World War. He will be named Under Secretary of the Navy to Josephus Daniels. This is going to begin to change things here. This is going to begin to change things here. Because now he's a member of the Woodrow Wilson administration. And you know, so he's going to travel a lot. Right now, you know, Eleanor's not all that politically motivated yet. And yet, in between one of his trips in 1918, she will be unpacking his luggage, and she finds some letters in one of his bags. Uh, from a Lucy Mercer, her social secretary, by the way. Franklin had been thinking of leaving her for a little while at this point. Well, now the fur, the, the fur hits the fan, right? And Lewis Howe, who was one of Franklin D. Roosevelt's <coughs> primary advisors, tell, you know, this is 1918. This is not 2017. You know, society was a little bit different. Oh, you can't leave her. You know, if you have aspirations of higher office, you know, you, you, can't, you, you can't leave this lady. And, but in steps Sarah Delano Roosevelt. Remember, the, a domineering person who did not want her son marrying this lady. She says, you're not getting a divorce, because if they do, I'm going to disinherit you. She tells her son. You know, money has a way of changing opinions. <laughs> So now the marriage becomes one basically of convenience. And Eleanor is going to start throwing herself into politics. Keep in mind, this is the same lady who, you know, if you gave her a sob story like, I haven't had a meal in a while, I lost my job, I'm subject to racial discrimination, she'd give you the shirt off her back. But then again, this is the same lady who will say, and her, and her sons or, son, or their kids will bear this out, that having children is a chore, and I'm not geared to motherhood. There, now, there's a psychological study for you. Interesting. Fascinating. And yet, later, Anna, her only daughter, is really going to be one of those who helps plan the liaisons between her father and Lucy Mercer when he's president. What a character, what a, what a study this family is. Wow. Yeah. But she throws herself into politics. She'll help her husband with this campaign in 1920 when he runs as the VP candidate with James Cox in the 1920 election. They will lose the election. They will lose the election. Calvin Coolidge will be the president, Republican. Silent Cal. And they will lose that election 15 million votes to 9 million and change votes. But Franklin D. Roosevelt is still you know, busy on Wall Street. He's a banker anyway. You know, I mean, the, the, uh, let's, let's understand that. Mr. Roosevelt, as a president, was Wall Street anyway. But he gets struck with polio in 1921. Now he's going to be crippled. Sarah Delano Roosevelt tells her son, become a country gentleman virtually retire. And this is where Eleanor really steps up to the plate. No. Because what will happen if he becomes a country gentleman? In the long run, that could what? Kill him? He's got to stay in the game. Stay in the game. And he will. Of course, you remember those are the days, if you've, you've seen these newsreel, uh, these newsreel footages, with him with the cane, maybe helped by his son James up to a rostrum to speak. And many times these journalists were covering him. It was usually from the waist up. You think that would go along today? Which makes you wonder that if he ran for office today, would he even get the first base? You know, it's not what's below the waist that counts, perhaps, is what's between the ears, perhaps? Hmm, interesting. But she's going to throw herself into these elections. 1924, 
1924, she works diligently to help Al Smith, the Irish Catholic, stay as governor of the state of New York. In 1928, she will throw herself into two campaigns. One, her husband running for the governorship of the state of New York, and also Al Smith running for the presidency, 1928. You know, some things don't change here. In the 1928 election, when uh, Al Smith was running against Herbert Hoover, and there were some in the Hoover camp that were saying, you know, and people believe this stuff. This, it's amazing what people believe. Well, if the Irish Catholic from New York makes the White House, he's going to install the Pope in the Oval Office. <laughs> and once the Pope gets there, the Constitution will be superseded by the Inquisition. <laughs> and people believe this stuff. Of course, Mr. Hoover's going to win and Al Smith is going to lose. But <coughs> Franklin D. is the governor of New York, the Empire State. And again, you know, again, Eleanor throws herself in, in, into this. She's going to be her husband's legs. She goes east, west, north, south throughout the Empire State, going to towns, cities, villages, whatever the case may be. Gee, what can we do for you? How can we help? You know, she's an ambassador for her, a roving ambassador for her husband. At the same time, she's working in this place called Todd Hunter School in New York for women who are disadvantaged. She was actually doing something along these lines with the New York, New York Junior Youth League, it was called, uh, actually prior to her getting married. And it was here she meets, um, she meets um, Mary Harriman, Averill Harriman's sister. Interesting the people she's, she's going to meet along the way here. Averill Harriman will later be Franklin's uh, ambassador to the Soviet Union during World War II. Fascinating, the people they meet along the way here. But she throws herself into, into, in, into politics for her husband here in the Empire State. She is, it's to, it's to, to such an extent that she's going to have to leave teaching at Todd Hunter School. However, what happens in 1929, the Great Depression? Things change here. What's interesting here is Gerald Swope, the president of GE, comes out with a plan known as the Swope Plan. The Swope Plan was, an, <laughs> was a plan for regulating the economy. Big business would run it in an effort to get us out of this depression. Herbert Hoover didn't want any of this. He said it smelled like warmed over fascism to me. Of course, you know, Mussolini, 1922. You know, he's building a corporate state is what he's building. That's what fascism is to a certain extent, a corporate state. And so he's, you know, and the people like Gerald Swope, John Roscob, uh, the, the, the Rockefeller, the Rockefeller people, so on and so forth, uh, Bernard Baruch, General Hugh Johnson, are all pushing for Franklin D. Roosevelt to run. And they tell Hoover, guess where the money's going to go for the 32 election? <laughs> it's not going to you, it's going to Franklin D. Roosevelt. Interesting because when Franklin D. is president, he will come out with that National Recovery Act. Remember that one? Yeah, that was a blueprint of the Swope Plan. It's a blueprint for a corporate socialist state, virtually what it is. But again, 1932, who will win the election? Franklin D. Roosevelt. He now, become, he now becomes president of the United States. Of course, you know, the, de the Depression really didn't help Herbert Hoover here. Uh, this is the same guy who will say, he will say that people, you know, gave up good jobs for better ones selling apples. Yeah, that'll get you elected. <laughs> that'll get you elected. But here again, Eleanor Roosevelt throws herself into, in, in, into her husband's presidency. Again, instead of just traveling the Empire State, she's traveling all over the place. Keep in mind, there, there's a 25% unemployment rate in this country at this point. 25%. And how many women are working? Not as many. There's no social safety net. It's rough. And there are these competing ideas going on here. Some people are calling into question our system of government. There's fascism, 
recently, Nazism, Bolshevism. Yeah, interesting. Of course, there's going to be a medium that's coming along here, electronic. It's fascinating, the, 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 the phases here of communications. Radio. What's that going to do for Franklin D. Roosevelt? Fireside chats, right? What did the radio do for Hitler? And then you fast forward to Kennedy. Television? Now you got a tweeter. <laughs> But it's interesting how you know some people take advantage of certain realms of communication here. But Eleanor throws herself into this in, into her husband's presidency. She will travel the speaker circuit throughout 1933. You know how much money she's going to make? Seventy-five thousand dollars. She won't keep much of it. A lot of it will go to charity. A lot of them go to church. I mean, this is a lady. I mean, she changes the whole idea of the first lady here. You know, when, whenever there's a change in administrations, and you had this one here with the Hoover, the Roosevelt administration, you know, she has meets with Lou Henry Hoover, uh, Henry, uh, uh, Herbert Hoover's wife. Her, uh, Mrs. Hoover, at one point, was an ardent suffragette. But as soon as she became first lady, she went back into this posture of being, what, a hostess? Lou Henry Hoover, she says, yeah, she told Eleanor I became a backstop for Bertie. And I can imagine Eleanor, <laughs> that's not happening on my watch. <laughs> that's not happening here. And it doesn't. I mean, she takes to the speaker service, circuit $75,000. This is a lady over the next 12 years, as a first lady, forget the president, as a first lady, she will give 348 press conferences. This is the lady who will, who will be the first first lady to speak at a presidential convention in 1940. This is a lady who will start a, a daily column called My Day in 1936, and she will keep this going until the year she dies, 1962. She will write 62 major articles in some of the country's leading magazines while she's first lady. I mean, there's no moss growing under the, the, the feet of this lady. She, she also, yes? Do you think all that would have happened if she and Franklin had had a real marriage? You know, would now, she that's a great, she's she, asking, would this have happened if her and Franklin had a real marriage? Now, that's a great question. I mean, would she have just been his best mm -hmm. stuff if... Yeah. <laughs> now, that's interesting, Be, can going bouncing back to her family life? Maybe not. But of course, that doesn't happen. But that's an interesting, that's interesting speculation. That's, you know, did, did, did her marriage situation spur her on here? I would hazard a guess and say it did. I would hazard a guess and say it did. I mean, after a while, this lady's going to have a spine of steel. She's going to need it. She's going to need it. She starts this thing known as Arthur Dale in West Virginia. This is supposed to be a settlement for miners. A lot of these are miners who tried to buck the system by unionizing, and they got fired. And the idea here is to have this development. The people will live here, work here, the kids can play here, go to school here. In other words, it sounds like one of these socialist experiments of the 19th century. One problem here. Well, there are several problems. Number one, Republicans think this smacks of Bolshevism. Even there are many Democrats. Oh, this is, this, is, this is government, and you're mixing government and capitalism. We can't have that. And then there are some of the miners themselves, the white miners. They don't want to live with Jewish miners and black miners. Oh, so now we have to have a separate facility for blacks, a separate facility for Jewish miners. This thing will continue until 1940 when it will come to an end. And many people said it was a loser from the start, government money going to this. She said it was a winner. And some of the people that lived here said uh, they never had it so good. They got out of the mines. They learned to trade, went to work, spent time with their families. So there's a lot of controversy with this. This is a lady as well who's going to meet some interesting people. <clears throat> and become affiliated with some interesting people. 
Lorena Hickok is one. Lorena Hickok was a well-known female reporter for Associated Press. She was also a lesbian. And she became good friends with Eleanor Roosevelt. However, her ties with Eleanor will help get her fired. Eleanor is going to take her on as a bullhorn, if you want to call it that, for the New Deal. Being a writer, she can write about the New Deal. Amelia Earhart is another one. She becomes pretty good friends with Amelia Earhart. There was a story that used to float around the White House that in 1934, when Amelia Earhart was staying at the White House, uh, her and you, know, you, if you if you're a first lady, you can't do this anymore. Uh, her and Amelia, her and uh, uh, Melanor and Amelia got all gussied up and snuck out of the White House for a night on the town. <laughs> <laughs> Amelia Earhart's interesting at this point because this is 1934 going into 1935, and she's a personality of note at this point. And uh, she was involved. She was actually involved in TAT or the Transcontinental Air Transport Company, which later became TWA. And she was involved with, uh, with Charles Lindbergh and also General Jean Vidal, Gore Vidal's father. Gore Vidal's father was a general in the Army, United States Army Air Corps. He was one of the first Army, one of the earlier Army aviators, learned to fly 1916-1917. And Gore Vidal liked her as a child. He really did. And Amelia Earhart was married to uh, Charles Palmer Putnam, the publisher. And that was a wretched marriage. He was constantly pushing her out into the limelight. And she wanted to divorce him and marry Gore Vidal's father. And Gore Vidal's father, who liked her, but he said, you know, I like you, but I don't love you. And Gore Vidal says, I wish that was my mother instead of the mother I had. He didn't like his mother. But he asked her one time, he said, you know, when he was, as she was planning this round the world flight, says, well, gee, I would think the Pacific is the, is the most dangerous area, you know, all that ocean, you crash, you're, if, if you happen to crash. She goes, no, she says, Africa's the most dangerous place because if you crash in the, de in the, in the jungle, they'll never find you. <laughs> What's going to happen? Yeah. But this is another personality of note that Eleanor meets along the way here. She will also throw herself into the black constituency. She is one of the major reasons the black constituency will vacate the Republican Party for the Democratic Party. She lobbies heavily. She even brings the NAACP to the White House. She lobbies heavily for the passage of the wagner castigan bill, 1934. Make it a federal crime for a lynching? That bill, will not get, that bill will not be signed by her husband. Well, I would have loved to have been in the White House in one of those private dinners between the two of them with that one. And the reason Franklin will not sign the bill, because of the Southern vote for the 1936 elections. He won't sign the, he won't sign the bill. But again, she throws herself into this. You know, she's, she's a foe of racism. Um, Marian Anderson, the singer, was supposed to sing for the Daughters of the American Revolution, and they canceled, the, they canceled that, 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 uh, that concert. So Eleanor Roosevelt does two things here. Two things. Number one, the first thing she did was cancel her membership to the Daughters of the American Revolution, and then gets Marian Anderson to sing at the Lincoln Memorial before thousands of people. In fact, she will bring Marian Anderson to the White House numerous times to sing for visiting dignitaries. She'll do that. But again, she was, she was anti-racist, very much for helping people who are down on their luck, they lose their jobs, so on and so forth. I mean, you know, I get it. I, sometimes I, you know, when, you know when, I, when I talk to my more liberal friends, uh, you know, they like to say how Franklin D. Roosevelt was a liberal. He was Wall Street. Eleanor was the liberal. Eleanor was the liberal. Eleanor was the liberal. Another one, another thing she'll be against too, is once the war is on, uh, when her husband signs uh, Executive Order 9066, 
rounding up the Japanese and put in, put, throwing them into the internment camps. How can you round up American citizens and do that? 112,000 will eventually be rounded up, thrown in the camps. How can you do this to American citizens? Of course, she's going to lose out there. That will happen. Another thing she does when the war starts, try, she's in favor of bring, bringing escaped Jewish inmates from the death camps to the United States. She's a big fan of this. Again, this is a person that feels for her fellow man. Again, she, again this one is shot down because the advisors tell Franklin D. Roosevelt, well, the Nazis will slip in saboteurs and spies. <laughs> I assume laughing because what's, what are you hearing nowadays? <laughs> yeah. Well, again, I would have liked to have been at that White House dinner in 1942, the two of them just sitting at the dinner table discussing that one. Interesting what you see here. You know, this is, this is interesting, too. Recall going back to 1931-32, when those bonus soldiers descended on Washington. You know, Depression, these guys wanted those bonuses they were promised in the First World War. They wanted them fulfilled now. And what did Herbert Hoover do? He sent the troops in, led by Douglas MacArthur, and Dwight Eisenhower was, was, his, was his assistant, and they pushed them out. Tore down, the, tore down the hovels, these guys, and the tents they were living in. And they were back in 1933. Franklin D. Roosevelt didn't send the troops. You know who went to visit them? Eleanor. What's the matter? What's the problem? Can I help you? Can we help you? And it began to, it began, a popular refrain began to be circulated among these World War I veterans. Gee, we were here last year. When we were here last year, and Hoover sent, them, sent the army. We come here this year, the president sends his wife. <laughs> yeah, interesting. Interesting the change from one administration to another. When the Second World War does start, again, you know, she's for bringing escaped Jews here, Jewish people here, uh, against the roundup of, uh, of Japanese Americans. She wants, to, she wants to volunteer for the Red Cross. At least this time, the advisors talk her out of doing something she wants. I said, well, you, can, you want to volunteer for the Red Cross. What happens if you're in Europe and you get captured by the Italians or the Germans? How would that look, the, first, the United States First Lady, in a Japanese or, or a, Italian or German prison camp? How's that going to look? OK, so now she'll, not, now she'll globe travel. And she's going to go visit certain battle areas. She goes to England in 1942. She's a big hit. She's a big hit with the British. Of course, at this time, the United States is slowly building up the United States Army Air Force for the bombing campaign against Nazi Germany. And she's a big hit with the British. 1943, she goes to the Southwest Pacific area. And she's visiting GIs and Marines and sailors in that hellhole known as the Solomon Islands. And she's actually in the mud with Marines in the jungles talking to them. You know, where are you from? What can we do for you? And, and Admiral Halsey will later say, of the many people that came to visit the, the troops under my command, one of the most popular was Eleanor Roosevelt. I mean, actually going into these berry, berry infested jungles to talk to these guys, as if to say you're not forgotten. Wow. Interesting here. Interesting. Fascinating. You know, and, and of course, as the war continues, um, her husband is still having his trysts with Lucy Mercer. But then again, there was talk about Eleanor here, too. Uh, there was a fellow by the name of Earl Miller. He was a New York State policeman. He was assigned, he was assigned to be Eleanor's bodyguard by, by her husband, Franklin D., when he was still the governor of the state of New York. At the time she was 44, he was 29, Earl Miller was. And Earl Miller was a constant companion for Eleanor Roosevelt. Really taught her how to dance, how to ski. They went to dinners together. Of course, then the stories start. You know, you know how this is going to work. And supposedly, 
she did have, uh, we'll call it, an affinity for Mr. Miller. And supposedly there were letters exchanged, which uh, the fate of those letters, some people say they've been destroyed. Some people say they're locked up someplace. I've never been able to see a copy of these letters. It would be interesting just to see just one. But can't seem to find them. Gay, yes, that's that was well. Uh, hanging around with Larry. Well, you know what happened here too. And you bring up this. She says uh, she was accused of being gay. Yes, because she also she didn't like sex, you know. <laughs> but she had six kids. But again, that goes back to what I mentioned earlier. She admits having children was a chore, and I'm not geared to motherhood. And yet, sometimes when she would retreat to the cottage of Valkyll. Yeah, Lorena Hickok was with her. And other women. She would get away from the family to keep the company of women that she liked. Well, don't some guys do that? You know, they go over here. Yeah, okay. But that's what she did. That's what she did. That's what she did. So, yeah, you're right. You know, there, there were those stories that she was supposed to be a lesbian. Now, whether they're true or not, I don't know. But when the war, you know, uh, the, not when the war is quite over yet, on April 12, 1945, Franklin D. Roosevelt dies. Remember my father was a radio man in the Navy. At this point, the, 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 he was on the last ship he was on during the war, the USS Ottawa, which was an attack transport, carried Marines. And my father was on duty in the radio shack. And my father always said that he was under orders. He said when he took a message, you made three copies. One stayed in the radio shack. One went into the ship's archives. The third copy went to the captain. Well, the captain has to know what's going on. So that message went to the captain. And my father was on duty on that ship when he took the message that Franklin D. wrote the president had died. And my father said, being 19 and stupid, I should have made six copies because you know, I didn't know I was going to have kids. <laughs> and he says, I should have made extra copies and brought them home. It would have been a nice keepsake. Would have been a nice keepsake. But you know, uh, uh, that doesn't happen. But anyway, uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt is in Georgia when he dies. And Frank Eleanor is not with him. Lucy Mercer is. Well, you know what happens when something like this occurs. Aren't the reporters going to be flocking around there like flies? They've got to get Lucy Mercer out of this house, but quick. And Eleanor gets the call. Your husband's dead, so she goes down to Georgia. But the fact of the matter is, what's interesting here is when a head of state dies, you know, that's when the cables and the letters and the, uh, you know, the condolences pour in, right? A lot from world leaders, right? Yeah. One of the ones that stands out here is the one from Stalin. Joe Stalin said condolence. Well, if Stalin's, if Stalin's capable of condolences, <laughs> let's put it this way. He was polite. He sent her a letter. But in, but in this in the, well, cable, in this cable, no one else does this. He says, have an autopsy done. <laughs> <laughs> have an autopsy done. And Eleanor's reply to this is, apparently Mr. Stalin doesn't understand that we are not that way. <laughs> have an autopsy done. That's Joe Stalin for you. That's Joe Stalin. Well, you know, Stalin, like any other totalitarian, likes continuity. And so he already had a working relationship with the leader of this country. Now that Mr. Roosevelt is gone, who the heck is this guy Truman? I don't know who he is. How are relationships supposed to, uh, supposed to proceed from here? You know, so dictators like a continuity here. They like predictability. And so with Mr. Roosevelt gone, and keep in mind, just a few months down the road, the British people aren't going to want Churchill to hang around either. So when it comes time to Potsdam in July 1945, Mr. Stalin is the only one left of the original big three. He's sitting down with Truman and Clement Attlee. They like continuity. Mr. Roosevelt has it in his will that he's going to turn Hyde Park into a presidential library. That's going to start this litany of presidential libraries, really, at this point. 
And, and so uh, Eleanor will move eventually to New York City. You know, she had, there's still the cottage up in Valkyll, but she'll move to New York City. However, there's an event coming up here that's tailor-made for this lady. Tailor-made. United Nations. And Harry Truman is going to, well, I won't I'll use the word assign, but ask her, do you want to do this? And she'll say yes. She will be the co-author of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights for the United Nations. One of the co-authors. She will be on the commission for the United, Na United Nations Commission on Human Rights. Be the first temporary director and be the first, per we'll call it permanent director. She will be there from 46 to 1952. Uh, it's interesting here, the, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which she co-authors, you know, the, the member nations that are joining the United Nations at this point have to vote on that, so it's accepted. Eight nations will not, will not accept it. The Soviet Union and five states that have been taken over by the Soviet Union in Eastern Europe, and there's two others. Saudi Arabia and South Africa. That shouldn't come as a surprise. However, this lady, you know, again, this is tailor made for this lady. However, you know, there is talk, you know, among certain Democratic Party members. Ah, Eleanor Roosevelt. Why can't we have her run for a House seat? Why can't we have her run for a Senate seat? Gee. How about the vice presidential slot? Uh, uh, uh. Interesting. Interesting here. Fascinating. And yet this is the same lady who will say, I'm not a politician. You know, you don't have to run for office to be a politician here. You don't have to run for office. She will throw herself into New York State politics. When her son Franklin Jr. wants to run for attorney general, <laughs> He runs smack dab up against Tammany Hall, run by Carmine DeSapio. Remember that name? Yeah. And he doesn't want here. He doesn't want Franklin Jr. as Attorney General. Well, that's all Eleanor has to hear. She's going to jump onto a committee to try to see that DeSapio is thrown out of Tammany Hall. That's not going to happen until 1961. But boy, she doesn't give up that chase. This is a lady that sometimes is like a terrier, grabs onto something and doesn't let go. She will campaign three times in 52, 56, and 1960 for Adlai Stevenson to be the Democratic nominee for president. Of course, we know what happens to Mr. Stevenson. He never makes it. He never makes the presidency. And, but it's the 1960 chase for the White House that's interesting here. She's willing, to, she's willing to back Adlai Stevenson for a third time here. A third time. Now, there are many Democrats who are going to try to talk her out of this. Why? Because of a rising young star in the Democratic Party, John F. Kennedy. She won't support Kennedy. She refuses to support Kennedy. Gore Vidal goes to talk to her. Why won't she support Kennedy? Interesting why. You know who else goes to, goes to talk to her? Frank Sinatra, and she tells Sinatra to his face, no. And well, why? Because, he, because young Kennedy did next to nothing to fight Joe McCarthy. Yeah. However, she will eventually change her mind and come around to support Mr. Kennedy begrudgingly in the beginning, but she will finally come around and support him because she understands, well, she's no dumbbell when it comes to politics. She understands how far an Adlai Stevenson candidacy is going to go this time around again. And so she will support Mr. Kennedy. Yes? She also had, let's call it, disagreements with Joe Kennedy. Well, you know, that when Joe Kennedy... <laughs> Yeah, well, so did her husband. Uh, when Joe Kennedy was the ambassador of the United States to England, uh, Mr. Roosevelt understood that 
that in 1940, Mr. Kennedy might want to run for the nomination for the Democratic Party for president, and there was the Irish constituency to be concerned with here? Well, in the, in, in the embassy in, in uh, England, come to find out the, the, uh, the telegrapher, the American telegrapher working in the American embassy, was passing secret cables between, between Roosevelt and Churchill to the Nazis. MI5 picked this up. MI5 is, the, is a British equivalent of the FBI. They give it to MI6, the British Secret Intelligence Service, who in turn gives this to, to, Mr., to, to, uh, uh, to the FBI. And the FBI turns this over to Roosevelt. And Roosevelt calls Mr. Mr. Uh, Kennedy home for consultation, a dinner. Hey, look, you know, one of two choices here. You can either run for the candidacy or we make this public. What do you want to do? Joe went home. That was the end of Joe Kennedy. And then, obviously, he's going to push his sons to run after him. Right. But yeah, yeah. That was, that, was the, that was the end of Joe Kennedy. So yeah, the, the, uh, uh, yeah, Mr. Kennedy really wasn't a big fan of Franklin D. Roosevelt, and then the Roosevelts neither were big fans of Joe Kennedy. Political necessity, perhaps? But big fans? No. No. Another one that Franklin D. Roosevelt was supposedly jealous of was Charles Lindbergh. Um, in, in the late 30s, he wanted to send General Jean Vidal to Germany to assess, Hitler, hit the, assess the Luftwaffe. But he had second thoughts. If he sends Jean, General Jean Vidal a government employee, it might look like the United States is sanctioning the Nazi government. So he sent Charles Lindbergh instead. And of course, when Lindbergh comes home, Mr. Lindbergh's going to say how great the Luftwaffe is and how bad the RAF and the French Air Force are. And we better wake up here and start building up air power. And uh, as much as, you know, there were, there were, Franklin E. Roosevelt was, was, uh, was a funny character, but he was, he was jealous of, supposedly jealous of Lindbergh's popularity, but he, had, but he knew good advice when he heard it. And he will support the growth of the United States Army Air United States Army Air Force. Yes. But to send an anti-Semitic to Germany to assess them. But he's not a government employee. And plus, Mr. Lindbergh knew airplanes and air power. Mr. Lindbergh will be a big booster of the new B-17 Flying Fortress. So the man knew air power. So he sent them anyway. Of course, Mr. Lindbergh is going to be called on the carpet by some people because he came home with a Knight's Cross, which Her Herman, Herman Goring supposedly slipped into his pocket. But so it's a good thing he didn't. Send, a good thing FDR didn't send Jean Vidal, yes. General Jean Vidal, in that, in that case in point. But Eleanor again, you know, works is going to be is going to be taken on by the Kennedy administration uh, in a commission for overseeing women's women's issues and women's rights, so on and so forth. Um, she will die in 1962, not long after the Cuban Missile Crisis, really. But she'll die in 1962. And Harry Truman will later say that Mrs. Roosevelt, Eleanor Roosevelt, was not just the first lady of the United States, she was the first lady of the world. And again, going back to that. That uh, poll taken in 1999, 37 years after her death, she still finished ninth as a popular, as a, one of the most popular Americans in the 20th century. Another interesting side note to Eleanor Roosevelt. Now, Franklin D. Roosevelt uh, was accorded 31 honorary degrees by various institutions of learning. Eleanor will get 35. <laughs> And 11 of those come from institutions outside our borders. So that kind of underscores what Harry Truman said, that this lady was not just first lady of, of the United States, she was first lady of the world. 
she was, uh, you know, and I just scratched the surface with this lady. I mean, she's a fast, I mean, again, this is, this is this point in American history where there are a number of fascinating women taking their play. Helen Keller being one, Amelia Earhart another. Rosa Parks will come along here. It's fascinating, the women that are coming along here. It really is. But she does, there's no doubt, she does change the office of the first lady. And we've seen that. Oh, and another thing she shares. Uh, the tallest first ladies we've ever had are Melania Trump, Michelle Obama, and Eleanor Roosevelt. They're all 5'11". No, nobody's pushed through the six-foot mark yet. <laughs> Interesting. Two of the three are back-to-back. -back. Yeah. Interesting. But she, was, she stood five, foot 11, five feet 11 inches tall. Interesting. Yes? I wonder if you could speak a little bit more about uh, Eleanor during the time of uh, Franklin's governorship of uh, New York State, because it seemed to me in my reading that uh, in 1930, 1931, New York State, New York City sort of got a head start on what would become federal programs to address the, uh, the Depression. And, and yeah. Francis Perkins, you know, uh, became part of the the cabinet and so on. Yeah, th this, is, this is where what you saw happen when Franklin D. Roosevelt was president, you saw him practicing when he was the governor with some of these different programs to, to, to right the New York State economy. Um, again, people in the background like John Roscob, uh, Gerald Swope were all parts of this. Uh, General Hugh Johnson. Um, you know, Franklin Roosevelt is going to use some of his contacts on Wall Street to do this. And again, it's, it's, it's Eleanor is not really too much a part of this, uh, but Franklin D is more, this is more, now you're getting more into the political, uh, financial end of how Mr. Roosevelt is going to try to solve the problems when he's president. But you see people like General Hugh Johnson, and he's important because he came out of the War Industries Board in the First World War, uh, br brought up by Bernard Baruch. Um, you know, you know when, when you go back to what happened just after the First World War, it's interesting. You know, the, the Franklin D. Roosevelt's at 20, 29, is at 29, 20, 20, 26, 29 Broad Street, New York. And there's a, lot of, there's a lot of influential people down here at this end of New York City. Again, you know, uh, people like Gerald Swope and so on and so forth. And what's interesting here, too, is uh, the, the, the Rockefeller interests. If you recall that, it's, that the, the John D. Rockefeller and Standard Oil, they got busted up by the Sherman Antitrust Act. And yet, again, uh, they're going to, the, many of their offices are at 2629 Broadway. Uh, you know, there's, there's like 33 uh, Standard Oil companies, and for most of them, their corporate office is, is down in this area. And guess who else was there? The Rockefeller family. So it's interesting, the concentration of financial power and what they're going to do, and what Franklin D. Roosevelt's trying to organize this when he's governor, but then what's going to happen when he's president, coming out with the National Recovery Act. Because how he's going to fashion that is, General Hugh Johnson will oversee it, and then he's going to appoint three other people. Um, uh, Walter Teagle from Standard Oil, New Jersey. Uh, also, um, Gerald Swope, GE. And, uh, and, and, and there was a, a director from Filene's in, um, in, in Boston, Mass. That will, that will be, that will also, Louis Kirstein from Filene's in Massachusetts. And they will oversee this thing known as the National Recovery Act. And they're going to try to organize the economy and bring it out of, out of, out of the depression. So it's interesting here, interesting here. But mainly Eleanor was, you know, running all over the state, drumming up support for her husband. What can we do for you? How can we help you? So yeah, you're seeing what's going to happen in the presidency after 33. It's, it's the minor leagues here in New York. So, yes? So we hear a lot about Sarah Delano. What was the deal with Franklin's father? I don't remember ever hearing, like, who was he and... I didn't do much work on Franklin's father. I mean, was he there when, when Franklin was growing he was, up? He was, he was, he was um, I forgot what year he died. I didn't do much work on his father. I just wonder if he like, died 
early or something since you don't hear about yeah, it. Yeah, it's it, by this so point, sir, by this point, by the time the by the time the two were married, Eleanor and Franklin, at this point, you know, it's just Sarah. She's she's a she's a she's a, she's a widow at this point. Very strong. Uh, yeah. Yeah, anyone I thought who, uh, Franklin's father was a good deal older than his mother. He was. I mean, keep in mind I mean, where, where the family made its money, too. Banking and railroads. Banking and railroads. Delano and Roosevelt. And it's an old, fam it's an old family tie, too. It wasn't, it wasn't new. Yes? Um, my male relatives that are all dead, they did not like Eleanor Roosevelt. And why is that? Did they tell that she should stay home and not be doing There was some of that. There was also some of the fact that. No, the, the question is she had some male relatives who were, she says who were all dead by now that uh, didn't like Eleanor. Uh, maybe to the point where she should stay home as a woman. Part of that is liberalism versus conservatism. Yeah. Yeah. My father felt that way, and he said, "Don't mention that woman's name in this house." <laughs> well, you know, you know, it, it's interesting. During the Second World War, during the Second World War, when you had the race riots in Detroit, and they were pretty bad. Male uh, chauvinists. Well, yeah, that, that, yeah, it's, it's kind of hard to give up old habits. When you had the Detroit race riots, there were people who blamed that on Eleanor. During the war, you know, keep in mind at this point you are still seeing here, and Franklin D. Roosevelt will sign a, an executive order, I believe it, believe it is, trying to desegregate the armed forces. Truman will take up that chase afterwards. He'll actually sign legislation, but even here, uh, the Air Force was really one of the first to desegregate the Army. Army was slow on the draw here well into Korea. You know, white units were getting the weapons they needed and black units weren't. So, so this was happening. You know, and the, and the Air Force was a new service by 1947, so they're hot to trot to try to lead the way here. But uh, yeah, the 1943 race riots in Detroit, there was some that, oh, that's Eleanor's fault because bringing the black constituency into the Democratic Party. So, yes? It says here that James Roosevelt known as Squire James, was an American businessman and horse breeder and the father of American President Franklin, Franklin D. Roosevelt. Roosevelt. He died in 1900. 1900, yeah. Yes. Yeah, and, and James and, uh, and Eleanor and uh, Franklin's son James is named after him. So, yeah. Yes? Um, you said she quit the DAR uh, to protest whenever she was protesting, right? Yeah, Marion Anderson not being able to right, sing. Okay, and I think I remember that. But then I also thought that she believed in staying within an organization to change it from within. I don't know which organization that was, if it was mm -hmm. just one, but she believed on staying on the inside, trying to change it that way. Was that a particular organization that I'm referring to, or was that, are you familiar with that? Um, no, not no, it's really. That instead of um, you know, fighting some of these people, she would right. stay inside and try to change people's minds. I thought it was DAR, but then I also remember that she put that. Yeah, she turned she turned in her membership after Marian Anderson was not given the right to sing for the DA, and then then she will see that Marian Anderson sings at the Lincoln Memorial, and then brought brought her to the White House more than once to sing for foreign dignitaries at state dinners and that kind of thing. But she was a feisty person. You know, she will fight her husband tooth and nail about that about that executive order nine zero six six. But wasn't she quite shy as a child? In, in the beginning, yeah. So how did she, she get to be feisty? Yeah, well, part of that was her development at, at Allenswood. Uh, some of that comes with confidence, too. Mm -hmm. I mean, here you go to she Allen. Didn't have the young one. Right, well, keep in mind, she loses her mother, her father, and a brother at a young age. Right. And then she goes to live with her grandmother and has to lock her bedroom door so her grandmother's right. sons can't come in there. Right. And, but wasn't, the, wasn't Teddy kind of a, you know, a mentor and a substitute parent to her to some extent. Yeah, but you know, I mean, he wasn't with her all the time though. I mean, you know, when she when she goes to Allenswood, this is when she really begins to blossom here because of that Marie Sylvester. Free thinker, critical thinker, learn history, learn French, become a well-rounded individual. And what does that do? Boats confidence. 
Right, this is when she was like 18 or something, right? She went there at 15, and she comes home after her 17th, after her 17th birthday for the debutante party, the, the coming out party. And so she will work in the, in the, uh, in the New, York, uh, New York Youth League helping disadvantaged kids. Again, another confidence booster. And so she's coming on here. But, you know, I mean, she really begins to take off when she finds out her husband is two-timing her. And then when he gets struck with polio and Sarah says, well, why don't you become a country gentleman? And Eleanor says, no. You know, now who's taking over here? Mm -hmm. And so you see this progression toward that lady who is going to become a political spitfire. And she will. To the point where she's going to change how the, the office, and it's an office, how the office of first lady is actually occupied or actually used. Yes? One of the things that probably gave her some confidence in her young years, the Val Kill we talk about, mm -hmm. and she and another woman, it was a furniture place. They built and sold furniture. And, then, and that was Eleanor's only piece, with all the homes they had all over the world, and in New York, that was the only piece of estate that belonged to Eleanor herself and nobody else. And that she was her had, retreat. Pardon me? That was her right. retreat. When, she, when the furniture defunct and you know, all the right. other stuff happened, then she turned it into a private dwelling. She also had an apartment in, the, in, in Manhattan, you know, in the brownstones. I had the privilege of going to the apartment with the next owner, which happened to be a man named uh, Larry Elgar, the famous man. Mm -hmm musician and they had Eleanor's apartment and it was a three floor walk up brownstone and I remember I was very young coming up the stairs and I didn't know any connection yet and I'm thinking look at the walls they were covered covered with pictures of Eleanor with famous dignitaries all kinds of important yeah. people three floors of it it seems the man who owned the building was a photographer and took full advantage of him, or he knew them. I don't know their yeah. connection. But the bedroom that she had, this wealthy woman, I would use as a closet. It was a small bedroom and not a mammoth apartment. It was rather yeah. surprising for this. Yeah, Val Kill, Val Kill for, for, uh, for, uh, uh, for Eleanor was that getaway. And it wasn't just to get away from Washington, it was to get away from her husband and the kids, too. <laughs> and the mother-in-law. And, well, yeah, the mother-in-law for at one point, but, I mean, I mean, Mars would have been a good place to get away from the mother-in-law. <laughs> but, uh, but, yeah, it was that, and, and again, she would go there with people like Lorena Hickok or, or, or other people, you know, a lot of other, other women that, that, that she gravitated towards. And it was a way of, um, I don't know, uh, it was a sanctuary, I guess, periodically. And sometimes you need that. We all need that sometimes. Yes? Now, who did raise the children? Uh, I guess she tried uh, when, she was, when she was there. Sarah did. But of course you have your governorness too. And the governors too, so. Uh, but, but again, though, there is that thing. Yeah, who, she's asking who raised the kids. Uh, somebody who says, I'm not geared to motherhood. So, it's a weird and maybe that leads to Anna uh, maybe not being close to her mother actually planning some of those liaisons between her father and, and Lucy Mercer. I mean, what kind of family is that? I mean, every family carries baggage. You know that. But, uh, you know. Uh, not that much. Not that much? I don't know. Some families, they're steamer trunks. Uh, you know, I mean, if you can get into this, I guess, with the Clintons and so on and so forth, the Kennedys, so on and so forth. Uh, all families have uh, the, the, the Bush family, I guess. You know, it's, 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 Truman. Yeah. Truman, well, yeah, uh, well, yeah, there, there's not, I guess. I mean, Truman was a simpler sort of fella. Yeah, Truman was a simpler sort of fella. What about Bess's mother? She, Beg your pardon? What about Bess's mother? I mean, they lived in uh, the house that uh, uh, Bess Truman's mother lived. Uh, yeah, maybe that's maybe that maybe that was a good reason to be president. You're back in Washington. So. Yes. The only difference between their baggage 
and the baggage of the people in this room is theirs gets publicized. <laughs> well, that's a good point, Eric. That's a good point. But you know, but but again, though, when you know, when you talk about Eleanor, yes, many people liked her. Many people didn't like her. Just as, as you were pointing out, and just as you were pointing out over there, yeah. Yes. But don't forget that in that time frame of that class of wealth. Governesses took care of your kids. Yeah. Right. So. right. And we're also seeing at that time too, as as it's not just the country; it's society. It's the it's it's society itself. Western society is changing, and women are making their making their presence felt. It's almost when when you mention Stalin's cable. And yeah, good old his, Uncle Joe. In his culture. Kind of got rid of their ruling class, and so maybe an autopsy was not out of. The, out of well, the you know what, what's you know what's interesting here too is when you again you look back at that era. Now you had somebody like uh, Amelia Earhart, who again there's no closure here, and yet she's she's an inspiration too for those women in World War II who we really don't talk about that much who flew a lot of those planes from North America across the Atlantic to, so the guys could fly them in Europe. Mm -hmm. And so they'd make that hop like from maybe Newfoundland to Greenland to Iceland to yeah. England. And some of them got lost along the route. I mean, not all of them were successful. They lost a number of lady pilots. Mm -hmm. But then some of them were spurred on by accomplishments of people like uh, Amelia Earhart. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Right out of Ypsilanti. Beg your pardon? Right out of Ypsilanti. Mm-hmm. Yeah, interesting. Interesting. Interesting how you see a change in society here. Interesting. Yes, Eric. So you talked about her USO tours. What about uh, uh, war bond tours and going to the factories? Yeah, she did that too. You know, you know, as as a war booster here. I mean, it wasn't much different than what some of these actors were doing, or some of these Medal of Honor winners were doing. You know, if you won a Medal of Honor, you were taken out of combat and brought home. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, she did that. I mean, it was all part of the cause here. I mean, it's all part of, in other words, America back then from 42 to 45, it's one giant community scene. From the first lady on down to six year old kids with red wagons bringing yeah. pots and pans to collection centers. Tin cans. You know, yeah, tin cans, whatever. Yeah, I mean, when you get six and seven year old kids to do that, boy, you got a war effort going. Of course, the question is now, how many kids six and seven have little red wagons? <laughs> Beg your pardon? They peeled off the silver from the gum wrappers. Peeling off the silver from the gum wrappers. Yeah. Well, if, if you, know, you, you want to you talk about trying to salvage things, you go to the siege of Leningrad. When the Russians were the people there, were, that city was cut off for 872 days by the Nazis. Uh, they used to send little children and the elderly into restaurants, granaries, and they, with little brushes like toothbrushes to get into the crevice of the wood in the corners to get the crumbs out. Wow. Yeah, they 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 would take the um, they they would take the needles from pine from pine trees and stew them and make a kind of broth or a, or a, or an ersatz tea if you want to call it that. Uh, some of these people were taking machine oil and sawdust to make to make sausage patties. And that's how they survived. I mean, the, the people will do what they have to do to survive. It's amazing what people will do to survive, or what they'll use, like you say, taking the silver off the, off the gum wrappers because they need it as as, as, a, as a commodity for war. Well, what happened to what happened to silk for stockings, ladies? Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. Pencils. <laughs> Lucky Strike Green went off to war and never came back. Yeah. Pencils that you put on the back. Did Eleanor ever indicate that she would have preferred her life to go in the opposite direction than becoming First Lady and losing her privacy? It's asking whether uh, Eleanor Roosevelt would have preferred being First Lady? No. Um, oh, not being first lady. first lady and having more privacy. Uh, n not being first lady, not be not and not losing her privacy. I think by the time that her husband was struck by polio, and by the time she put her foot down, I think that course had already been charted. Yeah. I think she was on her way, and I think she knew it. 
I mean, I don't have a missive saying that, that but, but looking back over the progression of history in this lady's life, I think by 1921, 22, we're off and running here. And, that, and she's not going to change course at this point. Uh, it's just a matter of how high we go. Governor's Mansion, then the White House, then the UN. And even after her husband's dead, she carries on. And she says, I'm not political. Well, who decides that? Uh, maybe, maybe the person who's, who's doing it is not the best judge of that. But then again, uh, maybe, her, maybe her epitaph is what Harry Truman stated, that this lady was not just first lady of the country, she was first lady of the world. So I think by, at, by 1921, 22, the latest, uh, this lady's into politics, and there's no turning back at this point. I mean, it helps make her what she is, a go-getter. Uh, you know, somebody who's transforming uh, women. I mean, it's another one, again, Amelia Earhart, who joined the National Women's Party. I mean, this was an early booster of the Equal Rights Amendment. Again, Helen Keller, too, a, com a, com a confirmed socialist who was, a, who was for birth control before the First World War. Uh, yeah, I mean, these are women who are really making their present. And they, you can, women can't even vote yet, 1920. And so, yeah, you're, you're seeing the change coming down the road with these women. Interesting when you, when, you, when you take a look at these women and then line them up and see the changes that are coming. It's fascinating. In fact, Helen Keller, folks, was a, was a fan of eugenics. Yeah, of course, the Nazis are going to sour that one later on down the road. But yeah, yeah, interesting, interesting, fascinating, some of these women. Yes? Yeah, I gave my talk on her the other day, and and you know after after the plane went missing, yeah. uh, there were you know you know if there's no closure, the story start. I mean you know how this works. Uh, there was an island 300 miles south of Howland Island, the island she was supposed to land at. Yeah. They thought the plane crash landed there. They didn't find the plane. They didn't find any bones. Uh, George Palmer Putnam's son thought that plane hit the drink. She's 17,000 feet down. Uh, there was another story. In fact, it was, it was put on television back in the 1970s how they had eyewitnesses that she and Fred Noonan were shot by the Japanese on Saipan and the bodies were buried on Tinian. Now, they sent teams there. They didn't find any graves. But there is an island where they have found bones uh, and remains of clothing that were uh, from the period. Yeah, but yeah. they still can't pinpoint whether it was her. And another one was that she wound up, she, she crash landed the plane and made it back to the United States and was a housewife in New Jersey. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Yeah, yeah. I, Irene Golem is the name. And there will be a book written about this. And Irene Golem will swear up and down, even though she supposedly looked a little like uh, uh, Amelia Earhart. I'm not Amelia Earhart. And she'll sue and she'll win that suit and the book will be yanked. But she was dogged for quite a while. Oh, you're Amelia Earhart. No, I'm not. I'm Irene Golem. I'm a housewife in New Jersey. I mean, that's, the stories are just amazing here. <laughs> Unbelievable. Although there's a, there was an expert in 2002 or 2003. His name is Rex Gillespie. He, hunt, he finds planes and ships that have gone down in jungles in the ocean, so on and so forth. And he says, by this time, he says, most of that plane's dissolved. Yeah. Yeah. It's not like a ship. You have a lot of metal on a ship. That can last a while. Take, take like the, the, the Bismarck or, or, the, or the Titanic. A plane? No, it's not a 747. It's a twin engine Lockheed Electra. And so most of it, yeah, it's probably dissolved by now. You'll, you know, beware the stories. Yes? So back to Eleanor. Uh, you keep talking about Eleanor being a politician. Which she was. That's a given. Maybe, maybe this is hair splitting, but isn't it possible she saw herself more as a social activist and politics was just the medium by which she could accomplish her goal? Well, if she was a social activist, there's no <laughs> doubt about that. But, you know, being first lady and the way she treats that office, she's a politician. 
You know, again, you don't have to be an office holder to be a politician. Well, I, I understand you know. that conceptually. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. But she was a social activist, too. But there's no denying that she really helped uh, push the woman's agenda, uh, as did those other ladies. It's a fascinating period of American history when you see the names pop up. It is interesting that we went from Eleanor Roosevelt, the activist first lady, to Bess Truman and Mamie Eisenhower, who were yeah. uh, the complete opposites. Yeah, who were not, uh, who were not the movers and the shakers. Um, but then again, there's, there's, there's Jackie Kennedy, who, I get, you know, of course, this story's been told many times, and I guess there's truth to it, that she lent a little class to the, uh, the office. I mean, she was a pretty lady. She dressed nice. and She dressed the part. Is that part of it? Yeah. It was arts and culture, too. Right. She redecorated the White House. Although Eleanor will say, although Eleanor will say that when she finally backs Jack Kennedy, you know, knowing how young the Kennedy kids were, she said, boy, are they in for it, especially now with television. Uh, she said, it's hard enough to raise kids in the White House. They will be under so much pressure, she says, you won't believe. Uh, and what's happened since? Yeah, that, that's happened. So, uh, well, some, some White House children have responded better than others. And some well, reporters have gone along with the president and first lady and said, you know, the kids, leave them alone. The, the Amy Carter, no one ever knows anything about Amy Carter because the press agreed to let her be a kid. No, Billy and Billy Beer got more press than she did. Exactly. <laughs> I wish I had one of those cans now. I'll bet you they're worth some money. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it, you know, some of these... Uh, some of these people that wind up in the White House or their advisors, too, are fascinating, too. They really are. They really are. I am going to be back here on April 3 because to uh, talk about the 100th anniversary of America's entry into the First World War. April 6, 1917. It's a decisive day in the history of this country. And I'm going to talk about what those changes were. It not only changes the country, it changes the world. In the words of that noted British general and historian, J.F.C. Fuller, he said, it not only changed this country, it changed the Europe and it changed the world. And ever since that day, we have never been out of European politics. That's interesting in, it. That's interesting in itself. Well, yeah, stay tuned for the next chapter. Is that what you're saying? Yeah.